Hi guys and welcome to this session. In the previous video, we discussed how we can estimate the beta for a stock and use that to compute the expected return from investment in that company. We estimated Tesla's beta to be around two based on the cap M. And this is also typically what is reported by Yahoo Finance and other data providers. And we also computed the expected returns of 33% for Tesla. In this session, we will try to modify our computation in the previous video and compute a more precise expected return based on the CAPM. In addition, we will estimate the expected return on Tesla using a model that includes the CAPM as a specific case, and it is called Fama French three factor model. In Fama French three factor model, in addition to the market factor that uh, we had in the cap M, we have two more uh, factors explaining the expected uh, returns. These two additional factors are the size and the value factors, as we will discuss later on. We will see how the expected returns would be different across these two famous uh, frameworks, the cap M and the Fama French three factor uh, models. Before we get into the details, let me explain one important point that relates to all these models of risk and return in finance. Typically, investments that come with higher risk should have higher expected returns. Otherwise, nobody would invest in those assets and companies. But the type of risk that would be rewarded are those risks that are not avoidable. In particular, many types of risk are firm specific risks and they could be avoided by diversifying your portfolio and investing in many different stocks and assets. For example, investing in a very young tech company involves huge risk taking. But if you invest only in that company, you should not expect to be rewarded with very high returns to compensate the risk you are taking because this type of risk could be easily avoided by diversifying your portfolio and holding many other stocks. If you hold many stocks, firm specific factors, good or bad, will not show themselves that much in the return you observe in your portfolio. On the other hand, there are types of risks that are not avoidable and we call them systematic or non-diversifiable risk. These are types of risks that are correlated across stocks. And even if you hold a very diversified portfolio, when those risks arrive, all or most of the stocks will be affected. And as a result, even if you hold a very diversified portfolio, you will see a clear trace of those risks in your portfolio. Think of the 2008 financial crisis. When this macro shock arrived, most of stocks, if not all, were affected. Of course, this is a specific example, but every day we are facing some good or bad macro news that is affecting most of the companies, and these are non-diversifiable risks. So these are types of volatility and risks that we cannot simply avoid by holding a diversified portfolio. And as a result, as an investor, you should demand a higher expected return for investing in these stocks. Note that when I say investors should demand a higher premium, it really means that they should pay less for the same expected future payoff. As a result, this means a higher expected return. Well, you may ask, how do we measure the systematic risk in a stock? We try to see how much this stock is exposed to the market movements, which is really the beta we measured in the previous session. So if a stock moves up and down a lot as the overall market conditions get better and worse, this is a stock that has a high systematic risk and the investors in this stock should demand a higher expected return. 
On the other hand, investors should expect lower returns when holding stocks in less sensitive companies or sectors like perhaps the grocery and food uh, pr producers or utility companies. This is the insights from the CAPM or the Capital Asset Pricing Model, which is still the most well-known and used model in practice for many applications. Now, let's briefly discuss the Fama French three-factor model and use it to estimate the expected return on Tesla. We can think of Fama French three-factor model as an extension of the CAPM specifically in the Fama French three-factor model. In addition to the market factor that we had in the CAPM, we have two more factors, as we said, explaining the expected return. These are the size and value factors. These two new factors uh, come from the observation that historically, on average, the return on smaller companies, which means companies with smaller market capitalization, has been higher than large companies. Moreover, uh, companies with higher book to market, which are commonly referred to as value stocks, have had higher returns than those with low book to market or the growth stocks. So the idea is that perhaps there are some systematic risk in these types of stocks, small and value stocks, that are not captured by the market risk as measured in the CAPM. So quoting from the original paper of Fama French that introduced the three-factor model, if assets are priced rationally, our results suggest that stock risks are multidimensional. One dimension of risk is proxied by size. Another dimension of risk is proxied by book equity to market equity. Again, of course, this was an empirical model and Fama French were silent about the underlying economic cause of these two new factors. So let's go to the codes we had before and adjust it to compute the expected return on Tesla using the Fama French factors. Let me briefly explain the steps we had in the previous video for those of you who have not watched uh, that one. Uh, and of course, the link to that video is also provided in the description to this video. We started by defining the period for our analysis and then got the stock prices from Yahoo Finance then, uh, since we wanted the monthly frequency, we converted the daily prices to monthly and then computed the monthly returns on Tesla. Then we obtained the Fama French three factors. So uh, here you, you see all the three factors. The first is the excess returns on the market portfolio, showing the return on this S&P 500 minus uh, the risk-free rate per month since 1926. SMB is the return on a portfolio of small companies minus the return on uh, large companies. HML is the return on a portfolio of value stocks minus that of the growth stocks. Of course, as you see, sometimes they are positive, sometimes they are negative, but let's take uh, the average of this long historical data to verify whether indeed these factors have been associated with a premium, at least in the long-term historical context. So uh, let's uh, simply get the mean uh, for uh, excess returns on the market and call it a market premium. Then let's take the average on SMB and call it the size premium. And finally, the average on HML and call it the value premium. Let's report these to see if they are actually premiums or not. Indeed, we see that all of them are positive, which means that on average, the market returns have been 0.68% higher than the risk-free rate. And remember, these are monthly premiums. Smaller companies have uh, had on average 0.2% higher monthly returns than large companies. And the value stocks have had 0.3% higher returns than the growth stocks. 
With this, given that Tesla is a large company and it's a growth stock, using the Fama French three factors should give us a lower expected return than if we use the CAPM. Of course, we will see if this intuition is correct or not after we are done with our analysis. Here I should also highlight something very important. When we say smaller companies tend to have higher returns or value stocks have had higher historical returns, we mean higher average returns. It's not that uh, every month or uh, even very often investing in small companies or value stocks uh, has higher returns than other stocks. In fact, most of times if you plot it, you see that the return on these factors switching from positive to negative, but on average, we saw that it's positive. Let's plot the returns on these factors to see how they look like. Let's look at uh, size, for example, and uh, to be clear, let's have a line that shows us a zero clearly. We see the return on holding small companies relative to large companies is sometimes positive, sometimes negative, but as we computed, the average of all these is positive. Now let's look at the value premium. Here it's kind of clear, even from this graph, that indeed investing in value stocks compared to the growth stocks have uh, had a positive return, at least in earlier part of the sample. But in any case, you see the huge ups and downs. In later videos, we discuss what do we really know about the size and value factors and whether they still exist, and if not, what could be the reason behind it. Finally, and importantly, let's also look at the market premium. As we computed, investing in the stock market gives us an average return of 0.7% more than the risk-free rate, which implies approximately an annual excess return of 8.4%. This sounds quite large and has been the reason behind many investors' decision to enter the stock market. It is very important to realize that this is, again, just the average returns which masks a huge variation in returns. To see this, let's plot the excess market returns as well. As you see, the return on investing in the stock market is frequently negative and sometimes very large negative numbers. Again, the premiums we are talking about here is the average excess returns over a long period of time, and in the short periods of time, which could mean a decade or so, we could have had negative returns on these factors. But the point is that at least historical long-term returns on them have been positive. Now that we have a sense of the market size and value premiums, let's continue to merge these factors with our return data. Here all is like uh, we did before. We use the last 60 observation from the merged data set or the last five years of monthly data to run our regressions for estimating betas. Also similar as before, we compute the excess return on Tesla, which is the returns on Tesla stock minus uh, the risk-free rate. Here we set up our regressions. Now uh, we have two additional factors as our right-hand side variables explaining the returns, which are SMB and HML. The rest are as before, we have to include the constant, use uh, OLS and uh, fit the model. Okay, so now uh, let's see the summary of uh, the results. Now we see that the beta is 2.27 using the Fama French three-factor model. And it's also highly statistically significant since the p-values are below 5% as you see, or the t-value is above uh, 2. 
As discussed in the previous video on CAPM, such a high level of beta for Tesla means that investing in the stock involves a high level of non-diversifiable risk, and as a result, rational investors should demand a high return on uh, such a stock. The coefficients on SMB and HML are negative as expected, which means that when we compute the expected return on Tesla using all the three factors, it should give give us a lower return than if we use the CAPM with only one factor. One point to note is that in this regression, these two factors are not statistically significant. This means that the Fama French model may not add much value in terms of explaining returns over the CAPM in this specific case uh, at least. So let's have this in mind and uh, continue. Okay, uh, we save these results in beta underline M for market, a beta underline S for size, and beta underline V for value. Okay, now we have all the three estimated betas, but before we compute the expected return based on the Fama French three-factor model, let's uh, redo our computation of the cap M using the market premium we computed here. In the previous video, we computed the market premium as the premium on the market portfolio only in our regression sample or the last five years. And using that would be problematic since the recent past may not repeat itself. And in fact, usually high returns in the past few years may mean uh, lower returns going forward to the extent that returns are mean reverting. For that reason, we typically prefer to compute all these premiums using long historical series. For the risk-free rate, the most recent risk-free rate is perhaps the most appropriate to use, but let's use the average during the regression sample as we did before. It's not gonna make a big difference. Uh, with this, the revised expected return on Tesla based on the CAPM is 20%, which is significantly less than 33% we computed in the last video, precisely because we were using the market premium computed from the past five years when the market return has been particularly very high compared with the average uh, historical numbers. And therefore, we most likely overestimated expected return on Tesla. Now, we can use this generalized version of uh, CAPM, which is the three-factor uh, instead of one-factor model, to estimate the expected returns on Tesla. Again, we need the risk-free rate that we already computed. We need the three betas that are the output of our regression we estimated above. And we need our factors, which uh, we also computed above and called them the market uh, size and value premiums. Now, let's see what the Fama French would give us. We need to add to the CAPM formula the additional terms for the size and value premium. Again, since both of these betas were estimated negative for Tesla, it means that our estimated expected return would be lower in this case. And let's see how much it would be. Yes, the annual expected return on Tesla's stock is about 15% using the Fama French three-factor model as opposed to 20% when we use the CAPM. I will be back soon discussing models that could potentially help us getting better estimates of the expected return on stock. Till then, I wish you beautiful days ahead and thanks for watching.